we have uh, Anjali and Swapna here. Uh, so very warm welcome, Anjali and Swapna uh, from Avana Capital. And we Thanks. are very excited to know more about uh, climate tech, all the amazing things that y'all are doing. And y'all are clearly uh, leading a lot of initiatives in this uh, area. So uh, very excited to know more about it. Uh, let me jump in, um, Anjali, and uh, you know, hear a little bit about how uh, you know you started Avana. Where has it grown from, and what's happening right now? Sure. So, hi everyone, and I see a lot of uh, known names here. So, good to see and happy Diwali and Sal Mubarak to everyone. Uh, so, our Avana journey started about four years ago, and uh, a bunch of us were ideating how to take the incredible power of technology and innovation which we are experiencing in India, applied to large scale problems, and along with capital and our own expertise and experience, help companies scale and thus create disproportionate outcomes. Outcomes as both in terms of financial returns, because you know you have to put capital to work and generate good return, and also create large scale impact. Um, so you know, many of you know by way of background, most of us are both operators and investors have spent many years in straddling really the startup technology, startup innovation ecosystem, as well as the large company industrial and policy ecosystem. So as Avana, we really sit at the intersection of all three. Uh, our world really is the startup innovation technology. And I'll well, invite Safna to talk a little bit more about our collective backgrounds. And uh, But then it, additionally, linking it and bridging it with the large industrial space as well as policy. So that's really the three intersecting circles of our world. Great. Thanks, Anjali. And uh, Swapna, I would love to hear more about you and you know, you recently joined and how's been your journey so far? Thanks, uh, Navjot, for this session. I'm super excited to speak to everyone. Uh, and uh, I think uh, at Avana, we are fortunate to be a like-minded group of people who believe in climate. And we have spent most of our careers in this sector. Uh, we are all engineers by either education or at heart and love working with entrepreneurs building for technology. And our belief, having spent time in India, is that technology can be used to solve some large-scale problems. And climate seems like the next big problem statement. Anjali and I often joke, should have been Web3 crypto investors, we ended up being climate investors. Uh, but that's a fun part, solving for harder problems which no one else is solving for. Uh, my journey has been, uh, I spent most of my career doing technology and saw technology solve large-scale problems at Qualcomm Ventures. Anjali and I know each other for many years now. And then it was just meeting of minds forever. And then it was time to just take the plunge and do it right here as we were launching Fund 2 at Avana, focus completely on climate. Yeah. Great. So when we talk about climate tech, what what exactly uh, does it encompass? Like, you know, a lot of us see it in a different way, but would love to know from you what all are there. In fact, for me, it was very surprising to learn that there are few things that also come under climate because uh, like a lot of people who are not very seasoned into this ecosystem, I thought about it in a certain way, but I realized it's a lot bigger. So, uh, you know, why don't you guys tell us what does climate tech mean? What is, you know, what all does... Uh, what all falls under climate tech? Okay, so if you, let's rewind to move forward. So I had a, a close friend of mine recently said, hey, listen, if you want to imagine the future, just go back and read Isaac Asimov from the 1960s. So also to answer your question, Navjot, let us rewind, say, 20, 30 years ago, where digital was not a thing. Companies did not have a CTO unless you were a Silicon Valley company or a tech company. Today, you cannot... Imagine any enterprise function that does not have digitalization embedded in it. So it's not a it's not a vertical, it's not a sliver, it's not a CDO, it's digital across the board. That is where we are sitting with climate and sustainability today. Over the next 20, 30 years, it is a planetary imperative, it is a species imperative, it is a business continuity imperative, and consequently, it's a huge opportunity. So the journey we have seen in the development of digital First, business models, uh, digitalization in the enterprise, the same journey and opportunity we will see in sustainability over the next 20 years. I mean, frankly, we should have started 20 years ago, but we're starting now right, to solve for climate. Climate, we, we look at climate with a fairly technical lens and solving for mitigation, adaptation, and resilience. And consequently, for us, our sectors of investment are the ones that constitute 90% of emissions in India. So that's really where you will move the needle. 
and are also 70% of India's economy. So they are large problems. So we are not solving small niche problems. We are solving large problems, hence large outcomes. Um, it's a truism of most venture investing, pick a large problem to solve. No point in trying to solve a small one. So that's how we think about it. And over to Swapna to tell us a bit more about the three sectors we look at. Totally, Anjali. I think Anjali put it well that we are technical investors. I think a lot of people assume climate tech as clean tech, project finance, putting in a lot of solar panels if you have solved for it. Uh, the unfortunate means is you need to do much more and that's what we're trying to solve at Tawana. So Anjali mentioned 90% emissions from three key sectors uh, and that end up being energy and resource management, mobility and supply chain, agriculture and food systems in India. And if you look at, like Anshri said, these are most sectors which contribute to our GDP, which impact the largest section of our country. In some sense, I need to be solved for immediately. Within them, you can keep drilling down to get to the lowest bottom level of what is where technology will impact and create large-scale outcomes. So, for example, if you look at energy and resource management, you could think about solving it from decentralization of energy grid to smarter buildings, to think about carbon data platforms. If you think about supply chain mobility, of course, everyone is talking EV, but it's much more. It's, it's more about using IoT and AI and the whole logistics and supply chain segment uh, because it's 14% of GDP versus 8% anywhere. It's criminal. So you need to solve for it. And lastly, the agriculture and food system because it's 50% of our economy as well as its large emissions. And also, it, actually, a lot of people don't think about it, but it's also 80% of water consumption. So a lot of water economies can be brought about there. So those are the three sectors we are focusing on and super excited because yeah, I think India is the best playground to build for some of the hardest problems. And you know, there is no global climate solution without India. So we talked about the sectors and why India, right? Why not somewhere else? Because we are the fifth largest economy, the fastest growing economy, the youngest population, the second largest and soon to be the largest population. We are also situated at a point in time in our own history, in the evolution of our country and also geopolitically, where we have very favorable tailwinds for our growth. So the next 20 years, India will continue growing. 7 to 9% GDP growth is required to hit that you know, 25 trillion economy that we all want to get to by 2047, right? India centennial. So the next 20, 25 years are critical. We will consume more steel, more cement, more power. 60% of our power is coal-based. We do have a renewable mission, uh, which I think we will achieve to get to half uh, 50% renewable by 2030 as well. So consequently, you can't solve for global climate without India. Hence, India is important. India is large. And India is also blessed. We are sitting, and all of us here are investors and in, uh, people and, and entrepreneurs. The quality of founder talent in India today, the unbelievably strong tailwinds from a policy as well as from a digital infrastructure build point of view, this creates a wonderful opportunity for us to solve for climate solutions, not just for India, but also for the world. Right, right. And uh, do you think, uh, you know, LP, the inter international LP base is also evolving and, you know, getting more uh, mature and also supporting this? Are you seeing a big support only internationally or equally or more in India? How are you seeing that? Well, I think uh, LPs are where money is. <laughs> no, but jokes apart, I think uh, what we're seeing is essentially the point that Anjali men mentioned. Climate is a global problem. People now understand that you can't solve for US, Europe and assume everything is solved for. You need to deploy capitals in these developing parts of the world and solve for climate here on the ground. So there is increasing focus towards deploying capital here. Also, I think uh, if you talk, hear from anyone, right? Larry Fink, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, everyone is talking about how la next thousand unicorns will be climate tech. So when someone's of that magnitude says something of this order, everyone is bound to start deploying capital. And then they think about India, 20% of world population, largest data set, some of the best entrepreneurial talent, the capital is showing up in these parts of the world. Right. No, absolutely. So so from a Avana standpoint, uh, what is your investment thesis going to be? I know you mentioned the three pillars and if you could also in your answer, repeat those three pillars for the people who've just joined. And do you think it's India or it's going to be India like countries as well in your thesis? You want to take that, Anjali? Um, so our thesis, as you mentioned earlier, is where is the largest problem and hence opportunity? and also at the stage at which we invest. 
So we invest at pre-series A, series A. The three pillars and the three verticals that we invest in are actually fairly large themselves, energy transition and resources, which is land, air, water, waste, mobility and supply chain, which includes logistics and industry 4.0. And then climate resilient agriculture and food security, which for obvious reasons is very, very important, not just for India, but globally, we've seen crop failures, we've seen massive supply side shortages on food and other and other agri commodities as well. Uh, and thus inflationary trends, right? So all of these problems are interrelated. Uh, and we solve this through a lens of mitigation, which is carbon reduction, DAT emissions, um, adaptation, which is helping to transition both economy and society. And third is resilience building. So that's what we look for in each of our businesses. Uh, so Navjot, that's what we solve for. Uh, we do look at primarily India because uh, our theater of operations, as it were, is primarily India, but we also invest outside India. Got we it. believe that there is a fairly good opportunity to do cross-border where technology that is developed in India can be exported and vice versa. We can incubate things that are coming from elsewhere. From an innovation perspective, we look at product innovation as well as process innovation. Uh, in uh, process innovation is something that you know the, the venture ecosystem has been investing in for a while. Product is somewhat newer, uh, and contrary to popular belief around climate, it is not just hardware. Uh, it can be actually software product. It can be material science based product. One of our star companies is Iki Foods, which has used which uses a patented polymer based growing chamber for controlled growth environment farming at industrial scale. Right, so. You have to bust a lot of myths here, but product innovation is actually also very exciting. We don't invest in lab stage science. Of course, we are science-based, uh, but business models that are ready to commercialize and scale. Got it. So actually on that note, would love to know uh, since uh, you know uh, this area has gotten more focused more recently, although a lot of good work has been happening for a while. Uh, from your portfolio point of view, what are your investments? Where are they right now? Uh, what is the shape of that? If you could throw some color on that. So we love all our companies, <laughs> but we can mention a few. Yeah. Uh, so uh, like Anjali mentioned, we have a good portfolio across process innovation and product innovation. And across the three key pillars that we stand for, which is mobility, energy, and food and uh, agri system, maybe let me pick something which everyone relates to here in our audience. As I said, we're also in the business of picks and shovel. So, for example, we have invested in a company called Terra.2. Uh, Terra.2 is building the largest climate network across the world. And what that essentially means, it wants to be linked in for climate. So, anyone and everyone who's there doing anything in climate would found, find this platform useful in terms of mentoring, networking, learning, finding jobs. And, and it's like AI. When AI happened, nobody was really equipped. When people were scrambling, I think climate, we are in the same space. We want to work in the space. We don't understand the space. We ask all, our, all the folks we know across the world to take their courses to learn more about climate, what's happening, how to be a climate worker in some sense. And I'm going to actually use this also as a, a one minute uh, input here that we also are looking to hire the best of the talent in climate, right? So we find some of these platforms very, very useful. And that's how everyone else is finding them useful. In fact, one of our companies we see that the founders found themselves in that network. So that's the power of the network. So those are first principle based businesses, big problems, big opportunity, and building for them. Got it. Got it. This is Terrado, right? Terrado. Right. And in fact, uh, anyone here who's excited about climate should go look, look that up, use one or two of their courses and learn more about the space. Yeah. So let's make an immediate pitch. And and actually, we are kind of, no, it's not, not a pitch for Terra, but in general, I think that Terra LFA, the Learning for Action, which is the foundation course, is a fantastic course. And okay. we have had almost everyone at Avana has now gone through it. As Swapna mentioned, we are now starting to see Terra actually show up on people's LinkedIn profiles and part of their CV. So that just goes to the, the virality that Terra is generating. That's amazing. I think we already have audience asking about Terra. So there you go. Uh, we have the link on the chat. Thanks, Riddhi. Uh, all right. Uh, so Swapna, one quick question for you. You know, would love to know your learnings since you've come from a deep tech background and you've done a lot of work at Qualcomm. How are you seeing the shift and what are your learnings? Yeah, I don't think there is a real shift per se. I would say the box is bigger now. At Qualcomm, I think it was all about chipsets and digital. I think now it's about much more exciting things. I'm also looking at chemistry. I'm looking at physics. I'm looking at 
mechanical, I'm looking at electronics. Other than electronics, I think like Anjali said, EK, which is a polymer science technology, right? I probably would have never done that as a deep tech investor at Qualcomm, but now the playing field is much larger. Uh, but also, I think uh, it's important to note that with process innovation alone, I don't think we'll solve for climate. So we'll see great companies come out of India, which are thinking through breakthrough technologies in some sense to solve for climate. And we're also seeing now capital being plowed in that area. I think earlier there was this whole perception uh, that, and it's still hard, but I think there's much more capital available for people solving for harder problems using harder technology. Got it. And uh, like you said, this is definitely like a bigger umbrella. And now you have chemistry, et cetera, et cetera. So do you think uh, it requires, uh, you know, do you think investors in this space should be uh, technically sound or uh, how important is it for, uh, you know, the investors to know the technical space? Um, so I'm going to take my take and I'll let Anjali give her take. We are a team of engineers and uh, business people, but we also have people who are economists, for example, right? We have folks who are chartered accountants. I think all you need is a love for technology and go deep in, feel layer, and no smarter people who can actually help you do some more diligence in the space. But I think you need to have spent time in the space to understand the space. I think essentially what we have seen is uh, most of the founders love the fact uh, that we have been in the space for far too long to know the nuances of how to build the companies in the space, how to scale them. So I think that is far more important than just the technical aspect. Got it. All right. Thank you. My take, I, I actually agree with Swapna that it is uh, while understanding the technology is important, all of it does not reside within the team. Uh, there are new areas that even we learn, but what we leverage is our very curated expert circle, which includes people with deep operating experience in all the relevant industries, um, folks from academia. So we are in constant touch with, say, the Columbia Climate School, the IIT Sarka, increasingly now with the Stanford Door School as well. Uh, and so we access minds and smarter minds than us when it comes to evaluating technology as well. Um, and I think we are pretty good at evaluating what will work in terms of business models. So what makes for a successful investment? Only tech is not enough, is our view. You need the tech, that is part of the moat, but you also need strong execution and a very robust business model. Got it. And is this model uh, and is this area something that needs, requires more patient capital or is it is it is that the wrong way of looking at it? Given the uh, maturity of this space, uh, is this space mature enough for a same timeline to be given or, or an extended timeline should be given for them to mature successfully? So my take on that, uh, honestly, is the technology iteration cycles have become much quicker. Uh, I think earlier from lab to prototype to a POC to, I mean, deployment and scale would probably be a 10 years. We have seen companies now do that in six months to two years. Right? So I think that makes us much more confident that what used to be deep tech of past where people would take much longer and hence we're hesitant investing. We are not seeing that with the next round investors or us also investing in the companies. For example, in EQ, within small period of us investing, it's a technology company, it's a deep technology company. We got the next round done. They're getting much more involved for, for the next round, right? So they're able to quickly commercialize, quickly scale. So those technology iteration cycles have become much, much, much more uh, shorter. And hence, the opportunity has become much, much larger. Got it, got it. No, super interesting. I think there's a lot of action happening here, a lot of LP interest and overall a lot of interest. And that uh, takes me to the next question to you, Anjali, which is on, uh, you know, how have you, how has fundraise been for you? How has been, we already spoke a little bit about the LP interest in this space, uh, but, uh, you know, I think a few of us in the group uh, that I can see, including myself, have have been fundraising in the recent past. So uh, we would love to know how has your journey been and any learnings from there? Journey is ongoing. Uh, so far, it has been extremely encouraging. I think both the theme and the team are resonating well with LPs. Uh, the different types of capital, of course, there, are, there is capital globally that is uh, allocated, climate allocated capital. 
There's also generalist mainstream commercial capital that is coming in for the returns. They see the returns from our first fund. They see our warehouse is already up and as we uh, go into the first close of our fund. So we've had good traction, you know, fingers crossed, knock on wood, all of that, right? Fundraise is a process. So, so far, so good. It's resonating well. Yeah, I think I'll just add there, I think uh, the story, India's story is much stronger than ever is what uh, what we are seeing. I think most investors, before we tell them, I think, uh, come from the view that uh, US uh, economy has its own challenges, uh, Brazil has its own corruption and currency fluctuations, Europe, we all know the shit show. Uh, so they, do, they are looking at India and rest of Southeast Asia as the next frontier of growth. So that I think is uh, good for this part of the world. Great. Uh, audience, we will open for questions in five minutes or a few minutes, but please uh, start sharing it on the uh, box and uh, we'll get to that. Uh, but uh, before we go to the audience, uh, to both of you, Anjali, Swapna, uh, the question we have is what was your personal turning point or motivation or driver uh, to you know find your passion and love in this space? I think, Anjali, we'll start with you. Sure. So uh, a couple of things. Um, one is most of my career has been in what is known in the McKinsey context as problem solving. And so you kind of, one gets drawn to, okay, what are large, difficult things to do? So I was doing microfinance 25 years ago when it wasn't an industry and saw the transition from a developmental philanthropic activity to now a mainstream asset class. Um, seen the whole journey of digitalization. And so the, uh, the, the big abiding problem of our generation over the next 20 years is around solving for climate and sustainability. So that's one. Two is uh, personal journey and some of you know this as well uh, already. My, my younger son, who's gone to college, actually chose his college based because the college announced a climate school last year. And I'm seeing some of the brightest minds of this generation between the ages of, say, 18 and you know 35 who, have, uh, who can do anything they want. They are choosing to apply their time, their talent, and their considerable human capital resource into solving this problem. Which means, you know, it'll capital has to follow where talent goes, and then very, very personally, I've seen the the devastating impact of climate, our uh, drought in California. We were hiking there last year, literally the week after we were hiking in the Cascades. Those trails were on fire. India has never had cyclones on the west coast. Like two years ago, we had cyclones on the west coast of India. We had large scale flooding. We are not used to it wet bulb temperature in Delhi goes to 35 degrees. You have, again, massive food supply uh, uh, interruptions, shortages, floods all over the place, right? So you recognize that there is something that needs to be done. Um, and when there is something that needs to be done, then there's also an opportunity. Absolutely. That's very interesting. I'm very inspired by, uh, you know, your son's journey as well. And I'm sure if we look around, uh, that's something very commonly that I'm seeing uh, you know, in amongst my nieces, nephews, younger brother, and uh, it's, uh, you know, it's interesting how we never thought of those things that they think of, which is very impressive. So amazing. So up now over to you. Yeah, I think my journey was a combination of knowing Anjali for a while, I would say. Uh, and uh, of course, pandemic and a few other things. So I think in pandemic, all of us had this soul searching moment, mine was really Am I solving for something which is large enough, uh, which will sort of create impact over the next couple of years? And then climate seemed like the next big problem to go after. I knew Anjali for a while. I was doing a co-investment with her. I was putting my technology and financial hat and, and she, she helped me see the climate side of it. And then it started making more sense that how you could actually invest in a company which could solve the large climate problems. And the third was, I'm part of this network called Kaufman Fellows, and I really made, met some of the brightest minds solving for climate in the global north. And then the question was really what's happening in India, and we need to build something for India. Great. Great. I think, uh, audience, please start your questions. And until you do, I have a lot of uh, questions. I would love to keep chatting. So let me just fill in till the audience uh, comes up. Otherwise, I think... The people I recognize in the audience, I'll probably call you out. And, uh, you know, the questions that you had earlier asked me, please ask directly. We have the valuable time of uh, Anjali and Swapna. So let's use that. 
but uh, we've done well on our rapid fire of 30 minutes with you guys and uh, <laughs> thank you so much uh i think alifia gauri if you guys we've had conversations on climate so if you guys have questions please post but uh, until then uh swapna i think i'm going to ask you uh if you could uh, change the world with uh two things related to climate what would they be and that doesn't have to be anything that's already happening and anjali i'm going to ask you the same after this Since that's very so interesting time. putting on the spot very aspirational <laughs> i wish i wish we could just ban plastic bottles wow yeah, i, I just be. every time i see them in boardrooms or anywhere my blood boils like that's like really in the world <laughs> little bottles everywhere um and i think the second really is uh, as a generation i see like what anjali was mentioning the next generation is more discerning than ever yes uh, i think we should just continue to encourage them to think about because i think when younger minds think about think about the problem they are facing and they solve for it the outcomes are much much larger so there should be constant encouragement for them to think to and solve for these problems absolutely absolutely i i love that one and you know my other question which i didn't ask was what would be some of the things that we can do not as founders but as human beings in india uh you know what we should start doing because maya who's not here today uh i remember uh, i was having coffee with her and uh, in bangalore and i told her i moved back to bombay and uh, uh, i i was telling her how the waste disposal in bombay is not segregated in my building and uh, she was very surprised and appalled and i was like yes maya but until i came to bangalore even i did not know this because the buildings never made us do it and she was so angry at me uh, but uh, yeah these are some of the things that we can start from day one from today right like plastic uh, um, at least you know try uh, so yeah thanks for bringing that up but uh, anjali over to you so i was thinking as you were speaking i think uh... if i could just have you know sudden miraculous fast forwarding of technology development on alternative fuels and storage and that is in my mind the single biggest bottleneck for a large scale shift to renewable and our biggest globally our biggest source of emissions continues to be using uh, fossil fuels so so storage mechanisms um i don't know whether the next energy source actually is whether it's hydrogen fission or fusion but something should happen quickly otherwise we keep burning fossil fuels the second is uh, i would say if we could just consume less as a society a lot uh, by the way the indian consumption footprint is 1/10 the average us north american footprint on consumption and consequently on on emission so so wait it's 1/10th of what others are doing or 1/10th of the world i didn't get that 1/10th of north america so when oh. i say we should consume less i think indians in any case not the group on this call today we are all the privileged lot i think we all over consume to some extent so i'm not talking about the average indian i'm talking globally consume less and a lot of that reduction in consumption and hence emission needs to come from the developed countries got it right absolutely i'm i'm actually in an ashram right now with a very evolved people in a place called merabad 6 hours away from bombay and uh, we got some toffees at some uh, some place downstairs and everybody refused to have it because uh, they had plastic wrappers and i was very surprised uh, yeah. they didn't refuse it because of sugar or anything but so it's it's amazing how people are actually uh, beginning to be conscious uh, also and i don't know if folks know but india is the first country where we actually now have a national policy for environment consciousness conservation and sustainability in individual level civic life it's called lifestyle for environment it was launched by the prime minister i think a couple of months ago it's called the life movement wow that's even i was not aware of that i think we should probably good good to be more aware i think we should probably circulate that internally also maya keeps sending us some documents but these are very helpful great i think we have some questions uh, from the group veni has asked a question on the ev space she says uh, would love to hear some uh, views on the ev space i think there are still open actually why don't uh, you unmute unmute yourself veni 
and uh, ask your question are you still in space i'm going to if, if vishnu's on online here we should point that to vishnu really vishnu okay, so maybe he had to drop off but uh, okay yeah <laughs> then we shall try our best in vishnu's absence hey short sure, folks happy to <clears throat> speak this one out but uh firstly just wanted to say thanks so much for organizing this um i think we can all agree that climate uh sort of you know action is going to be here and it's it's uh really cool to see a bunch of smart people uh spending time on this um had one question on ev uh had been looking at the space myself and uh, felt like there are open questions around um the base infrastructure that is available as well as distribution mechanisms uh, that are there and that's that's something i feel a lot of uh, companies have struggled with and in that context i was wondering which pieces would end up with oems and which pieces do you guys feel uh, would be sort of you know hot for disruption by startups um, using all of those terms loosely there um uh, but yeah uh, because i feel it's one of those spaces where i think the existing sort of the large giants will still have still have a <clears throat> massive role to play so yeah so if if i got your question right your question around that we are still using batteries which are powered by electricity no so uh um, maybe if i'll be phrase this so we see that um one of the biggest challenges in ev is probably around how do you sort of distribute it or how do you create a base infrastructure to enable this industry to go grow uh, and uh, because and at that level that distribution sort of exists with oems as of date um so while there is a flurry of startup that have entered the market in different spaces uh, the true power or the distribution game still ends up with the oems so is this so which part of this ecosystem do we see sort of sitting with the oems and what role will the OEM, will, will the oems continue to play versus what pieces will the startups actually be able to innovate on um that's uh, another iteration got it. so i'm going to take a shot at it shot at it we do believe like you that oems will have a larger pie uh, share of the pie be it the honda be it the mahindra be it uh, the tvss because they have the distribution like you mentioned of course you will see innovation in pockets for example i think three wheeler innovation we are seeing lot of it happen from new startups right because uh, not existing too much of three wheeler distribution infrastructure being used because lot of was still china uh, similarly we are seeing slightly more innovation on the two wheeler side Uh, I agree on the four wheeler problem. We will not see a Tesla and Rivian from India as soon as possible because it does mean many moving parts. But what we are interestingly seeing, and that's what I was referring to earlier, as picks and shovels, is people who are enabling the ecosystem. And so we have invested in a company called Turno. Uh, Turno is a very interesting example of how it has enabled EV financing by solving for a problem where, uh, as you buy EV, the total cost of ownership goes up. uh so people do need uh, loans and other mechanism to buy those vehicles and nobody really knows how to underwrite ev because people have traditionally been underwriting ic engine so they have got into the world of ev financing and now they have grown very fast because they took a small problem and solved for it so we are seeing a lot of those small little pockets for example battery recycling battery recharging etc probably not so much on the oem side uh, and so please add if i miss any other key component so i think there are also pieces of the value chain in charging infrastructure which uh, could go not could not be not with oems nor with startups they may actually stay with incumbents like the discoms the uh, utilities and the distribution companies there's a lot of discom privatization that's going on and the discoms are actually fairly they already have buyers running they have meters they have access and rights of way so it is possible that a bunch of uh, charging infrastructure and uh, base infrastructure that you call it stays with discoms or it goes to what's basically sort of gas station electrification so your hpcl vpcl and they're all sitting on prime real estate and as the fleet transitions into 50% ev by say again 2030 what will they do with that i think some of these things will evolve a little bit and may go neither with oems nor with startups that's a good point yeah 
but but i think startups will have a very very significant role to play on pieces of the model that where there is no business model for it today so distribution distributed storage for example there isn't a model for it so can surplus battery capacity be used for energy storage the short answer is yes but someone has to develop a model around it um similarly the kind of work that turno is doing so turno has done some ground breaking work where they already have 60 70% market share in in bangalore today for the small commercial vehicle operators your one ton two ton vehicles which is the backbone of intercity um so i think something will so turno has done a great job we are looking at similar players in the space, adjacent spaces the startups still have a big role to play great i think we have uh, uh, sorry uh, does that answer your question yep thank you so much great we have two or three more questions uh as since we have another one on ev let me take that up first ragini is asking what is the opportunity for greening of ev charging infra moving them to grid to uh, renewable in case you want to add something to your question ragini please unmute yourself this is good yeah okay no i mean that's absolutely <laughs> like 200% right what is the opportunity massive uh i think the challenge is not in transitioning it but it is in base grid loads so there is a beyond charging infra problem which is what i had referred to earlier around storage so uh, i mentioned earlier also 60% of india's power is still coal coal fired and the advantage of thermal I mean, there are many many disadvantages we won't go into all the disadvantages obviously but the advantage of coal is it's very reliable so you know how much load you will get when by burning how much coal right whereas with renewable the the single biggest bottleneck to large scale greening is storage what do you do when the sun goes down and then you need to have some base load on the grid for stability but otherwise uh, the movement is i don't think there has been any new thermal capacity put into india for the last 6 years till this just a couple of months ago ntpc announced some new thermal capacity otherwise all capacity there's no new coal capacity going in it's all renewables in power generation and uh, grid and renewables is not mutually exclusive the grid in fact includes renewable great i think that answers ragini's question rohan had asked is there an opportunity in climate sas yes 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 many, very many. exciting opportunity in climate sas <laughs> we are very excited right we are seeing a lot of uh, uh, enterprise sas type plays in carbon accounting in scope 3 in measurement in offsets and credits in water um as well as as we are starting and we talked about some of the uh, saas plays also in in mobility for example right um anju would you mind uh, double clicking on the opportunities in water that you mentioned so the carbon accounting measurement piece it's it's pretty hashed out today a lot of players and a lot of uh, sort of interest there but a common critique that i have uh, you know sort of come across is that people are sort of on the divide as to whether the market is deep enough or not and uh, i'm struggling to see how climate saas could be a deep enough opportunity like software standalone models could be a deep enough opportunity for the indian market so would love to get a little bit of context on that so i would say saas we no longer build saas only for india right saas you build in india for the world so most of these are now global opportunities um and it's not clear yet how what is the level of efficacy in the current scope 3 accounting models either so some new work will happen there and new models will also emerge there uh, on the water side similarly i think there's, there's a lot of conversation around digital water so so similarly measurement flow usage efficiency that will come through and then i think we'll continue to see saas models emerge for reduction of waste and efficiencies in uh, logistics and supply chain and then agri of course is seeing a bunch of saas plays emerge as well sapna you want to add to that 
No, I think well put uh, across sectors. I think it's not and climate as a theme in general. I think wherever you can, and I think one of the very interesting conversations we were having with the, someone globally was India has twenty percent of the world population and the most comprehensive data yeah. set, which is why the potential of building anything in SaaS here and iterating and sandboxing and taking it to the world is so much easier. So not one space, but across the sectors, we are seeing this companies emerge which are thinking of. How do we solve it by building a platform, software platform, which can be taken? Rohan, does that answer your question? Okay, yes. He's yep. saying, thank you. Thanks, Rohan. I think we have a last question from Alifia, who uh, is has asked me to ask uh, this to you in her, on her behalf, which is, we have seen an increase in climate and gender sessions across conferences. Uh, which is heartening. Would love to understand how this intersection lens is showing up in investment decisions in the boardrooms and in technical assistance provided by investors. So I'll let Anjali take the boardroom. <laughs> she sits on many of them and sees them every day. I think investor decision, you look at our team, right? We are uh, two of us here. Shruti is our investment director. Ruddi is our analyst. We also we, we are highly diverse, by the way. It's not just the men. Our investment principal is Vishnu, who is a male. We have an analyst who is Saksham. So it's a good diverse group. I think this diversity just helps you make, make better decisions. But we are seeing that taking the charge in investment decision. And if nobody is giving you a seat at the table, maybe you create your own table. I like the sound of that. Great. I think that's the end of our, uh, you know, question. Maybe let's get to that boardroom. I think that's something we should yes, see. Yes, Many of course. Think about. Yes. So I think the, the boardroom discussion has been a very rapid, dramatic transition from sustainability sitting somewhere either in audit and compliance and pollution control board related problems to uh, CSR. And then now rapidly becoming investor relations and uh, and strategy. So the, uh, this is literally in the last three to four years, the dialogue has moved very rapidly. It is a uh, integral part of most corporate strategy and boardroom discussions. Our diversity had gone that way anyways. Uh, I think we have made, uh, I would say we have probably mixed track record on gains on diversity, unfortunately. I think we haven't made the kind of gains on diversity we should have made in the last 20 years. Hopefully, we'll make better gains on sustainability in the next 20 years. But it, it is a very critical component now of business decision making, both on the revenue side, uh, reputation and corporate brand, as well as on the cost and compliance side. Right. That's... Uh... If anybody else have a question? Uh, uh, one last question, Anjali Swapna. Thank you. This was very useful. We are seeing a lot of accidents and reputational crisis on EV space. How do you see that impacting adoption and the startups which are there in the space? Do you see any moment from the regulatory side or what are your views on it? You know, so this story has just come up that a child died when because the battery went up and things like that. It's, it's unfortunate, I would say, and I don't have any particular point of view beyond with you know, health and safety and quality does have to become an as important an element as, in product design as is uh, speed to market or, or cost. I think overall, the problem does have to get fixed. Right. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. This was really enriching for me and I'm sure for everybody in the audience, I learned so much uh, that I didn't know about and of all the amazing uh, things that are coming up. And uh, I'm sure in India in the next, not in the next 20 years, but maybe in the next two years, we'll see a lot of shift and uh, climate tech will be at the core of it. Uh, so thank you for sharing this knowledge with us. And uh, yes, we I just was just checking if there are any more questions, but no, all thank yous uh, for your uh, time. I think we did very well on 45 minutes, got a lot of information and uh, intelligence from you in this time. So thank you so much, Swapna and Anjali. 
and thanks, audience. Thanks, Namshut, and thanks everyone for joining. Uh, any smart climate entrepreneur or anyone looking to join a team of uh, climate workers, please reach out to us. Absolutely. I think uh, Anjali should uh, Anjali should bring uh, bring about our motto at this point, which is that trespassers will be recruited. <laughs> <laughs> They're always hiring. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you Anjali and thank you Swapna thanks Rudhi for all the help thank you thank you everyone bye